Welcome to the Momnesia Podcast, a podcast for moms where we share the stories we want to remember and the ones we wish we could forget. We're your hosts, Julie Short and Sarah McLaughlin. Doing well. Good. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to you. You guys sticking around in town? We are not. We are going to be heading to Tennessee, which oh, really? is interesting because you're thinking, wait, I'm going to be with your sister for Thanksgiving. Right. I'm going to see my other sister. Okay. Yes. Karen lives in Alabama, and so we're meeting halfway. Got a cute little Airbnb. Oh, that's fun. So that way we um, each can drive about five hours and, and meet up. And you, will you like cook a big meal there or will you guys go out then? We are going to try and cook, believe okay. it or not. That cool. was one of my concerns. I mean, do they have a turkey baster in an Airbnb? <laughs> right. They probably don't. Right. I should probably pack one. You should have put that in the search box when you were looking <laughs> for the perfect Airbnb. Exactly. But uh, the in-laws went down a little early, so they're checking it out, seeing what we need. Okay. And then... Uh, We will either shop or pack accordingly. Okay. Well, that's cool. But you guys are sticking around, correct? We are. um, We'll be at my in-laws on Thursday. We'll be at my parents on Saturday. And then we do a kind of neighbors um, with some friends on Friday. Friendsgiving. Friendsgiving. Yeah. We're totally trending. Um. I wanted to talk to you about something that has okay. been, I've been listening to this week that you introduced me to. Um, so for a lot of our podcast listeners, mm-hmm. we know that many of you are first time podcast listeners. So as Sarah and I are finding fun new podcast, we want to introduce them to mm-hmm. you. And Sarah introduced me to one that I absolutely love. I've already listened to all the episodes. Okay. It's called Everything is Alive. Tell them a little bit about yes. Everything is Alive. Okay. So actually it was someone, I think it was Sarah Cherry on our Momnesia Facebook page that recommended it. And oh my gosh, it's so funny, but it will surprise you with how how it's charm and whimsy, like take you to this kind of surprisingly deep place. So it's Ian Chillog, who I think produces, wait, wait, don't tell me on NPR. And I also love that. One of my all time faves. Yeah. And so what's going on is every show is an interview format and it's personifying an inanimate object. For instance, a can of Coke and his kind of life journey that he's on. And it's (laughs) so weird. And it's so clever. I was so, listening to that can of Coke one in the grocery store. <laughs> okay. I always wish I could like see what people think of me as I'm walking <laughs> through the store right. laughing out right. loud. They're like, oh, who's that special woman? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Can of, can of pop was a good yes, one. Yes. Yeah. But my favorite one was the grain of sand. Did you listen okay. to that? Oh, I've listened to all of them. Okay. Yeah. What, this why one, so? Yeah. <clears throat> so the grain of sand one, like I had to like pull over and I'm like, I have to write this down. It was so deep and yes. moving. Mm-hmm. So, I, okay. So there's a grain of sand. I don't know how to pronounce the name. Yeah. Chioki or Chioki. I don't know. Yeah. like that. Um, but he starts off by talking, you know, I am a grain of sand and he kind of stops pretty early on and says, you know, I'm really having trouble using this pronoun. I, Mm -hmm. we typically refer to us as we are sand, but you humans don't seem to have that mass pronoun. And, uh, Ian responds Uh and he's like, are you saying like, why don't I consider myself a grain of humanity or a a fraction of humanity. And his response was just, Ooh, made you punch in the gut. It says, I, yeah, that, that seems to make more sense. It seems to me like if you were to recognize the degree to which you owe your existence to others, you might also be nicer to other people. Mm -hmm. Wow. Right. If we recognize how dependent we are upon one another as humans, Mm -hmm. that we aren't this 
island um, right. that we might be kinder to one another. Mm-hmm. And you know, that's kind of my go-to kindness. I, yeah. I'm trying to focus my energy on being kind and, and, and putting that and kindness by, that out. Yeah. exactly out into the universe. And that was just so, it, it stopped me in my tracks. Um, yeah. I it's think, that African proverb I am because we are. Yes. Like we, <laughs> it, it, that, that's it. Like there's nothing without all Correct. of us. And I think we, because we do have such, um, an American culture of individualism. Like, I wonder if, uh, there would be more of that mass pronoun use in cultures where Mm -hmm. the community is, is larger, like in some of the Asian communities. Right. Um, I wonder if that is reflected in the language. I always think about cultures where, you know, they don't go through the they probably go through what's my purpose at, at some level, but um, the idea of linking that to our jobs and our callings and all this kind of stuff, like they may be a 12th generation bricklayer and the fact that they are continuing in a line, working hard, providing for their family and tapping into something that so many ahead of them have done, I think even that is probably part of that, like they understand being a part of the whole and there's a loyalty to that. And there's a sense of purpose, not about just the work, but about who did it before you Mm -hmm. and why it's important to continue doing it. And I think also that families living all together. And I think the work is probably you either live to work or work to live. Mm -hmm. And um, I suppose all that kind of plays into that with other cultures. We really missed the boat on that in America. (laughs) We did. And I think we could all do a little bit better job Mm -hmm. of of thinking of how we relate to the, to the bigger part of humanity. But the, the deep thoughts don't stop there, Sarah. So (laughs) the other one that, um, made me kind of laugh. This one wasn't quite as deep, but he says, you know, you all often express a great deal of surprise that there is sand everywhere at the beach. Right. <laughs> yeah. He's like, I remember every experience for humans being somewhat frustrating when they sit on me. Yes. So <laughs> that you forgot the suntan lotion or right. you forgot or that the weather wasn't what you th- it was too right. hot or. Yeah. yeah. So really I funny. thought that was hilarious because I do. I, I love to look at the beach Mm -hmm. and I love to be on the beach, but I don't like spending a great deal. Like I would rather be on a pool overlooking, overlooking the beach. Yes. Well, it's a lot of work to get all the stuff down there, blow the stuff up. It (laughs) is. And it just is everywhere Mm -hmm. for weeks on end in every nook and cranny and crevice. It's a lot like motherhood. You're like, I, why do we do this? I'm not doing this again. Yeah. But I do, do. I do love those. Um, they've come a long way in wagon technology. Yeah. (laughs) Those like sandproof, um, the big tires where you can lug everything out Mm -hmm. on the beach. I don't have one. Yeah. I don't either. But I look enviously on the fact that they're making it. (laughs) Yes. I look enviously into that. Okay. The other one was, um, he says all, okay. So I think Ian asked, like, do you get tired of people like sitting on you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and he didn't really answer that question, but he said, all of my existence is reflection and observation. So I am never bored. Boredom seems to reveal a fundamental anxiety that humans have with their existence in the first place. A constant question of where is this going? What should I be doing? So then there really isn't a willingness to just sit and be, which I really recommend you should try it sometime. Mm. And that also hit me, man, because I do not do well with sitting and being. Even you saying that, I'm like, well, what are you supposed to do? That's, <laughs> no, be. Yeah, just be. And that silence that can fill and just the constant like barrage of thoughts of what I need to be doing, what I could be doing, what I should be doing from laundry to like, we need new gutters to, um, Mm -hmm. just everything. So when Matthew or Mary Kate come up and they're like, I'm bored, what do you say to them? 
I mean, because their list should be different. They're the kids. Right. But what <laughs> They're do you... not worrying about our gutter situation. Right. What do you tell them? Um, I tell them it's okay to be bored. Yeah. I also tell them that when they're hungry sometimes right. too. <laughs> it's Especially okay to be hungry? When it, yes, yeah. because they are always the most hungry and the most thirsty as we are going to bed. Oh, oh yeah. Always. Right. So I'm like, you know what? It's okay to be hungry. Mm-hmm. You'll get some food in the morning. Right. Yeah. Just sit with that for a while. Uh-huh. Um, but yeah, but I do, I, I like that idea of boredom in our children because it does force them to get creative. Right. And not, it's usually happening when they're not allowed to watch TV. Right. Or be on a tablet or mm-hmm. play a game. Right. I'm bored. Ugh. Right. So I do like that in children, but for me, I, it's not even that I want to fill the noise with a game or with mm-hmm. um, a TV show. Those are nice. Yeah. But just being able to quiet that voice. Mm-hmm. So last night, this is different than complete boredom, but versus having a screen on or telling the kids what to do, I said, you know, just get out a board game. And um, we'll, we started playing Monopoly at seven with the two older kids, oldest kids. And at like 10, 10, I was like, okay, we have to stop. We played all that time. And it's just, it's like, there's a different level of quiet. Um, and they were enjoying each other so much by not having that other distraction of stuff. They were enjoying entertaining each other and Soren was so sad that he kept sneaking or slipping her money because he's like, I said, well, that's not the business model of monopolizing. And but he cares like, for his but sister. If you were poor and you someone owed you rent, if they were poor and they owed you rent, you would help them. <laughs> Anyways, God bless him. God bless him. But when it was my turn, I'm like, no, sorry, I have to. I have my own kids to to feed. So I got five kids. I got to feed, buddy. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, but they um. They had really, you know, late at night, quieter house. We didn't have all these distractions. It was just simplified. I just, I'm like, I'm reminded in those times that we really noticed that we like each other. Fun. Sometimes boredom can be good. Mm -hmm. Totally. So we need to learn how to practice that. Yeah. That act of stillness and quietness. Right. And being. Should we have 10 minutes of silence right now? Let's. Do it. Do you guys want to sit in 10 minutes of silence with us? It'll be a great practice. Oh my gosh. So are you now going around like wondering if everything has a personality? Oh my goodness. Sarah, uh, you are going to laugh at me, but this is something I have done since I was, since I was young, but it kind of got sparked again after listening to this podcast. So I was, I was sitting on the toilet. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Can't wait to see where this goes. All right. Um, and I was getting ready to wipe and noticed that there's only two squares left on the roll. Okay. Now, okay. this is more than a tw- two square job. Okay. <laughs> but I couldn't get myself to just throw the roll away. Even that paper that's like stuck with right. that. Toilet glue. paper glue right. on there. This toilet paper, its whole purpose in life is to wipe something. Right. And I am going to deprive it of its purpose <laughs> by just throwing it in the trash. Right. I couldn't do it. I had to rip that <laughs> off and get another roll to uh, add to it. But I didn't want to deprive it of its purpose. And I feel right. that way about cereal. Like when I was little. <laughs> if there was like a little bit left over, but my bowl was full, I thought, I don't want to separate this family of cereal. <laughs> These flakes belong together. They do. What They're if, so weird. What if that is a mom and a daughter and I right. am like ripping them apart? Or if I just threw those little, those little crumbs in the bottom of the bag away, would they fulfill their, their cereal life purpose? Right. 
These are the things I think about, right. Sarah. Man. Deep thoughts with Julie. <laughs> <laughs> that's so funny. That's that's what I've been thinking about. We'll um we'll introduce you to some other really cool podcasts that we are listening to. Um if you hear of others that you think we should mm-hmm. listen to, send them our way. Um either uh, Put it on Facebook for us to see, send us a message, Instagram, all that good stuff. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and turn a corner. It's probably a good idea. (laughs) I'm really excited to have our next guest on. It's someone from my childhood. Uh, We met in elementary school. I think we were probably eight years old. Her name is Tamar Sternfeld. Uh, Tamar Nadler, for any of you that are from my past, uh, we... Met in Indianapolis Children's Choir, but actually continued to intersect because we went to school together all the way through high school. Um, She's someone who I love what she posts on social media, both about her family, her profession, how her Jewish faith really informs her life and her family's life. Uh, I find a lot of hope out of what she posts. And I think this interview really ended up speaking to a lot of what we've talked about with the we our sand idea, like being a part of a community, being a part of a community. I mean, being a part of a village, it is, I don't want to spoil too much, but like, I think it's really kind of going to blow y'all's mind when you hear some of the things that she shares about community experiences she's had. So we had an opportunity as kids to travel around the world, actually in this music group and kind of create some, bonds that last, even though we only get to see each other, like we've maybe seen each other once in the last 20 years. And it was at a reunion a few years ago and we kind of rekindled our friendship. It's amazing how travel can do that. It really just like bonds your heart together when you experience new cultures, new communities, new food. Yeah, totally. So let's go get tomorrow. Okay. Tamar, welcome to Momnesia. Thanks for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, we were just talking about how our friendship goes back a long, long way, but we have so little interaction being in different cities now that um, I have to be like, tell me your married name again. (laughs) But um, we have a lot of history. We met when we were in elementary school and had opportunities to go great places and sing amazingly in intricate, beautiful music together and do things that a lot of kids probably don't get to do. So oh, form for some sure. strong bonds, I feel like. Yeah. So tell us who you are now. What What is life professionally? And tell us about your family. So life professionally actually is, um, is in transition. Um, so I guess I'll start with my family. Um, I'm married to my husband, Scott. Um, we were college sweethearts. We met when I was 20. Um, and he was 21 or almost 21. Um, we dated through college, got married right afterwards and kind of started the whole life journey together. And where did Um, you go to school? University of Illinois. Okay. We met at U of I, um, and kind of met by happenstance. Um, there's a a place on campus, like a Jewish gathering place on campus called Hillel. Okay. And, um, I had not been very involved my freshman year and my sophomore year decided I wanted to go on this Israel trip that they were doing. Okay. And the deal was that like they would subsidize the trip and then you would, um, come back and, um, like be involved in Hillel and help with the growth of Hillel on campus. Okay. Um, the girl who had been the woman who had been my roommate on the trip and I decided we're on, you know, opposite sides of campus. We're never going to see each other. It's a huge school. So we're going to meet up every Friday night at Hillel and spend Shabbat, the Sabbath together. Okay. And, um, the very first Friday night she showed up with Scott because they had been friends from home and he had been off campus for the last semester gotcha. doing co-op. And, um, we became friends for a little while and then probably about a month later started dating. Okay. Um, yeah. And kind of started our, like our, the beginning of our relationship, like right then and there and okay. graduated, moved to California, moved to DC, moved to Akron, Ohio. And now we're living in Charleston, in Charleston, South Carolina. We have 
three kids. Um, our oldest, Hadassah, is 15. She's a okay. freshman at high school. Wow. Which I never thought I would be the mom of a freshman. Right. <laughs> how did that happen? <laughs> I don't even know how that happened or how I'm surviving it or anyone is surviving it for that matter. Yeah. And then we have a, a almost 13 year old, our son, David, who, um, he's going to have his bar mitzvah at the end of December. And, um, our young, thank you. Awesome. Um, our youngest Noam is nine and in third grade. Okay. Professionally. I, um, after Scott and I got married, I started out in healthcare, um, working as like a patient care tech in an ICU out in California when we were first living out there. Okay. Me and I lived all over. I really have. It's a little yeah. scary, but you know, seven years in the same house, there is no more. This is my final resting. <laughs> I joke that my next move is going to be to a pine box. Which <laughs> my mother hates when I say that. Right. I'm sure. <laughs> right. I remind her, I'm not talking about tomorrow, but right. I had this day in the ICU where, um, there was a patient who came in. I originally, I wanted to be like a physician's assistant. And I had this patient came in and, um, she was not a practicing Jew, but had been born Jewish. Okay. Um, and, and her family had found her unconscious and, um, for whatever reason, the day that she came into the ICU, I was the only Jewish person on the unit okay. and the nurses like didn't know what to do. And the family basically said, they're like, we know that she would want to die with all the Jewish burial rites and have the Jewish traditions mm. that was important to her, even though she wasn't connected. And so here I am this like 22 something fresh out of college with no connections to the community other than like my own experiences. Um, and I ended up being the advisor to this family. And I walked out of work that day, spent about a half an hour in my car in the parking lot, sobbing hysterically, mm. thinking my entire life, and realized that I really wanted to be in Jewish communal work. I wanted oh, to be wow. working in the Jewish community and engaged. And um, my father is a social worker, and my father has worked in the Jewish communal world for about 50 years now in a variety of different facets. Um, so I applied to graduate schools um, and then got accepted to um, the program in Maryland. So we moved out to D.C., um, about a year and a half later. And mm. I, um, I have a dual master's. I have a master's in social work, um, and a master's in Jewish communal service. Okay. And I worked for about 10 years, um, serving the Jewish community in a variety of facets. I was, um, a camp director, a youth director. I ran after school programs, family programs, holiday programs. Um, I did senior programming. So I worked with senior adults, um, and then kind of progressed in my career where I was supervising, um, kind of all of the programs and services that would run through a Jewish community center. Okay. Um, we moved here to Charleston about seven and a half years ago. Um, and that was kind of what I was doing at the time running the day camp was kind of the biggest chunk of my portfolio, but, um, really spent a lot of time engaging with families. Yeah. Uh, I left that job about four years ago, um, to go to work for a Jewish youth movement. That's like an international movement. They have teens and programs all over, um, all over the world. And, um, after about three years working for them kind of had this like epiphany of a moment, which is actually the, the story I kind of wish I could forget. Okay. So we'll, I guess we'll get to that in a minute whenever you're ready. Yeah. <laughs> but you can jump right for in. It. Yeah. I guess I'll start with the story. So my, um, my oldest about four years ago when she was in like fifth and sixth grade, ended up being hospitalized a number of times. Thankfully, oh, wow. everything's fine. We kind of ran through all the scary tests. There was nothing scary going on. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's it's pretty terrifying when your kid's in the hospital. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And my husband and I, we would kind of, every time it happened, we would drop everything and stay with her in the hospital. And, you know, we had these nurses who would come in and what can we do for you? How can we help you? Yes, we're running these tests. We know that it's scary. We know that you have other kids at home. Thankfully, my parents live here. They moved here about five years ago. So they live in our neighborhood, which has been the biggest blessing. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, it's been amazing. And um, the the ability to kind of know that we can focus our attention on the one child and not worry about anything else mm -hmm. and that everything else is going to be fine. Um, my parents were amazing in caring for the kids. What was really amazing was that one of the hospitalizations actually happened when we were in Atlanta over Passover. 
Um, okay. We were supposed to go home, I think, on a Tuesday, and we ended up, she had one of these episodes, and we ended up in the hospital. And um, I sent a text to, to, I think, one friend back home in Charleston and said, we're not coming home today. We're coming home tomorrow. We think we're back in the hospital. Okay. And all of a sudden, my phone started blowing up with these group texts from... I love to call them, I call them the villagers. It, oh yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, they're, they're talking back and forth and I'm just like observing all of these texts flying in and the back and forth was, okay, when do you think you'll be home? Probably mid afternoon. All right. Well, you haven't been home since Thursday. I'm going to go to the grocery store. I'm going to buy all this food for you. Wow. I'm going to say what kinds of fruits and vegetables do you guys like? I want to make sure you have your, your kitchen's full and I'll bring over dinner tonight. I'll bring over dinner tomorrow night. I'll do. And, and everyone just kind of jumped in. Like immediately they just assembled the villagers and everyone hopped in and, you know, one friend's like, all right, just tell me how to get in your house and we'll make sure it's clean and taken care of. Wow. And while I would love to be able to forget the the pain and the fear and the anxiety of having a kid in the hospital, Mm -hmm. I will always remember. And I have, I tell my children all the time that it's, this is just what we do. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, one of the villagers mothers passed away about a year ago and, she has three older children. They live at home. They're, you know, college, like high school-ish. And you know what? She had to be in out of town with her mom, with her dying mom. And her three sons and husband were kind of a bit of deer in the headlights. Yeah. So three of us went over to their house and we sat down with each of the sons and said, all right, pull out what you're wearing to the funeral, pull out your winter jacket, wow. pull out this, pull out that, you know, you're going to somewhere where it's really cold and it's not cold here. And you got to think about this. And we got those boys packed and we emptied out the fridge of stuff that was going to spoil. And we did their laundry and we cleaned, you know, like, and, and my kids just, I'm grateful that my kids were able to see and be cognizant of this is just what we do. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, um, my, my older two are like right in the middle. I call it the bar and bat mitzvah circuit, you know, we're <laughs> all the time. And our custom at our synagogue is that the Thursday morning before a bar bat mitzvah, we show up, um, for morning prayer services. And the, it's the, the bar bat mitzvah child's first opportunity to be called to the Torah. And it kind of, you do it a couple of days before just to kind of get rid of the jitters. Mm-hmm. You read from the Torah, from the sacred text on Thursdays anyway. And so it's a chance for that child to be given the honor in a very intimate setting, mm-hmm. you know, maybe 20, 30 people there, they're nearest and dearest. And then there's always a brunch afterwards. And so for our friends, we'll typically buy them like a small gift, but my real gift, our real gift to them is to host this brunch. Mm-hmm. Because we want to teach them that, you know what, you're now an adult in the Jewish community and, and this is what community does. You show up and you take care of one another. And, um, you know, for, for my kids, I love that they're being given this opportunity and that they're kind of learning as we go. Um, so the, the hospitalizations kind of led me to where I'm at now, um, mm-hmm. which is about three years ago. No, Two years ago, um, I left my job with the youth movement and um, actually went went back to school okay. and decide what I wanted to be when I grow up. And I've gone into nursing, um, so I'm in a nursing program. Um, it's actually through the Citadel, which okay. for those from Charleston, um, every time I say that, someone's like, "Oh, I didn't know the Citadel yeah. had." It. Yeah, and I get to look at them and say, "Well, we're the first class." Oh, cool! Oh, wow. So it's really cool. It's a very small, intimate group. There's we, up until this semester, there have been nine of us. We had another cohort join us. So in total, we're 21. Um, we know each other really well. Sure. Um, and it's been a really great team experience. Um, I'm kind of one of the oldest people in the group. And, um, you know, kind of like we, we've all kind of found our, our spots. And I think mine uh-huh. is sort of like Mama Hen. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, we have a test coming up. I'm the one to reserve the study room. <laughs> We get together, we teach each other. If I don't know, you know, okay, this person's not coming to class today. We'll get the handouts and we'll make sure they get them and everybody's, you know, so it's, it's a really great group. I I have friends who kind of remind me like, you know, they'll say things like, oh, I'm really impressed. I'm really proud of you. And I'm like, don't say that because then I'm going to stop and I'm going to lose my drive. And May 4th is not coming fast. Mm, Right. We graduate and then we're done. It's been really neat to see my children go through this with me, I guess. Sure. Um, 
my older two were babies when I finished graduate school. My oldest was um, three and a half and my youngest was like a year and a half when I, or my middle one, I'm sorry, was a year and a half when I graduated. So they kind of saw it, but didn't really see it. Yeah. This time these kids are all in, like mm-hmm. they know that four nights a week, I'm, I'm not home. Doing homework class. with mom. Right. Yes, we do. We sit at the home, you know, we sit at the, the kitchen table together and we study together and they know if I've got a test that I'm locking myself in the library at school and they've taught me how to use Quizlet. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> like I, I've, I'm super grateful for that because I don't know that I would have figured it out on my own, <laughs> Right. Uh, but I'm also working part-time. I have two jobs that I work at. So one of them is I work at the Citadel um, as a tutor um, and I tutor in anatomy and physiology and chemistry. Um, and then my other job, I'm actually getting to use my social work degree. So I work as a, a case manager at one of our local hospital systems. Okay. Uh, so I like, I float, so I don't have a floor that's mine. Um, I have to learn all the doctors and all the nurses and all the systems of every floor and every yeah. hospital. It's fun. It's challenging. And I'm learning a whole heck of a lot about healthcare as I go. So it's it's been a really neat experience. And I'm grateful that I have the social work background because it allows me to do this job. Sure. Um, but it's I'm grateful that I've been able to do it. Yeah. Um, we have so much to dive into I know. in that small portion of what she said. I know. And I have, I'm like writing down questions because I don't know what happens on your end, but when we speak, since we're Skyping, it like takes the audio away from what you're giving. So I don't want to even say, or, or gasp right. or say, wow, to anything. So <laughs> we're, we're doing that all silently here, but, um, First of all, let me, can I ask one question? Yeah, you go. Because this is not going to be like, oh, we're going to need to dive deep into this. But you're right. The Citadel? I mean, wasn't it not even long ago that they didn't even allow women there? Yes. How long ago did they start admitting women? About 20 years ago. Okay. Uh, And this year actually is the very first time in history, and the Citadel is now 176 years old. Um, It's the first time that they have ever had a female regimental commander. Wow. Gosh. This has been like a really huge year for the Citadel. Yeah. This nursing program is brand new. Um, the first class of evening. So we're evening undergraduate students. So I'll have a second bachelor's degree when I'm done. Um, but we are all night students, so we don't have to wear the uniform. We don't march in parade. We don't Mm -hmm. have to live in the barracks. Thank God. Um, (laughs) but the, the, we will be graduating this spring and the next spring, the first class of cadets will be graduating. Okay. Um, and so things. are you a cadet? That's I guess, yeah. That was the other part of my question. Like, are you somehow, you know, Colin, he went to the Air Force Academy. I don't know if oh, you yeah, know that. I forgot, yeah. He spent a semester there, but he had to go to basic training. Right. Went to that first semester, realized this is not for me and transferred. Um, but if you had stayed any longer, you know, you then owe the military I think like right. four years of service. Mm-hmm. So when I think of the Citadel, I think of a military school, yet right. it doesn't sound like that is your experience there. So the Citadel is a military college. It's the military college of South Carolina. Mm-hmm. Um, it is for a lot of the cadets. Um, it is the only way that they can get out of whatever environment they were living in. They come They join the Citadel, they join the Corps of Cadets, they get their bachelor's degree, and then many of them will enlist. Um, And then because they've done that, my understanding is they don't have to pay back anything. They they serve their time in the military, and all of their expenses are are washed away, Hmm. Um, which is pretty awesome if you can't afford school and if you, you know, and then they serve our country, many of them for a career. We, however, we are nighttime students. So we are, you know, the only way you can go to the Citadel and not be in the Corps of Cadets is either to go as a night student, or you can go, um, if you are former military, if you're a veteran, you can go as a day student. There are a number of undergraduate programs. There's a number of master's programs actually at the Citadel as well. We are, we have been very, very lucky, um, because I've kind of, in doing my research before kind of jumping in, I looked at a number of programs, a number of nursing programs, and the fact that we're small is a huge draw. Oh, it's um, huge. A lot of the nursing oh. programs. Yeah, a lot of the nursing programs around here are 100, 150 people. Um, you get lost very easily. And nursing is very much, I call it a team sport. 
Mm -hmm. um, which is what you want in healthcare. You yeah. want your nurses to be collaborating with others, to be working with others. You want your nurses to be working with your social workers and your case managers and your pulmonologists and your, you know, all the, the different specialties that factor into your care, because then you're going to get the best care possible. Mm -hmm. um, and so the teaching style that we're being given through the Citadel is, te it's a team approach. Every class we have had, there's been some sort of group project, group experience, group presentation that you have to do together. And naturally, as a cohort, because we take all of our classes together, we've really bonded and we really support one another. Sure. Um, so it's been a really neat experience and it really speaks to the, the mantra and the mission of the Citadel. Yeah. Um, so I've really enjoyed it. I've really appreciated it. I realize other people may not be interested in this, but I'm in higher ed, so it's fascinating right, sure. for me. <laughs> sure. And the other thing that you said, and we won't spend time, I'm sorry, but I do have to ask. I didn't even know you could get a master's in... Jewish communal. Jewish communal. I didn't either. Yeah. yeah. Like I, who so, knew you could so, niche down that far? So you can. Jewish communal work as a field, um, it started coming out as a higher ed program probably about 20, maybe 25 years ago. There's only a few programs in the country. Baltimore happened to be one of them. Mm -hmm. um, there was one in Michigan and uh, one in LA and one in New York and one in Boston, and maybe Philly. Um, there's a couple that you can do online. Mm -hmm. um, and at the time, you know, 12 years ago when I was doing this, there was um, the, the, it was a dual degree program in Baltimore that I did. So I got both degrees at the same time. And because of that, I think I had like six or eight credits that crossed over between the two. The point of the program though, with Jewish communal work was they are looking to really kind of breed the leaders, the, exe the future executive directors of these agencies. So we had coursework in nonprofit management and we had coursework in, um, in uh, financial resource development mm -hmm. and um, supervision. But then we also had, had courses in, you know, Bible. And so we studied the old Testament. We had a course where we studied the Talmud, which are, a collection of texts that were written, I think like in the first century mm -hmm. that was basically extrapolating commentary from the five books of Moses, from mm -hmm. the first five books of the old Testament yeah. and the rabbinic adapting, tradition, right. And adapting it to the first century and the Talmud kind of evolved when the temple had been destroyed and, um, the Jewish people, the Israelites were expelled from Israel and, you have this whole religion that's crafted around um, sacrifices and doing things at the temple, but now you don't have a temple. So what do you do? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so the Talmud kind of emerged from that. So we had coursework in that we had coursework in Hebrew. We had coursework in um, sociology of Judaism and what American Judaism looks like because yeah. every Jewish community is different, but then there are similarities mm -hmm. and uh, you know, for, for, generations you've had these Jewish communities and these agencies have arisen, but now you don't have people or at the time you didn't have people managing these organizations who really understood that. So these Jewish communal work programs evolved to kind of meet that need. Yeah. So the people that I went to graduate school with, um, at this point are either the majority of them are, if they haven't left the field are like assistant directors of Jewish community centers, Jewish federations, Jewish family services, Jewish volunteer services. Um, they're, uh, you know, heads of school in Jewish day schools. Mm -hmm. um, everyone in my program did a dual master's in either Jewish communal work and social work, Jewish communal work and um, nonprofit administration, mm -hmm. Jewish communal work and MBA, Jewish communal work and Jewish education. Um, there, there was a broad range of what we did, but we all had that Jewish communal service yeah. Uh, masters kind of uniting us, learning about all these different agencies that exist and what they do and how they help the community and how to kind of connect people. Yeah. The so. Jewish community, the Catholic community, and I feel like the Lutheran community really have those like service agencies. Yes. Down pat. That's they are of, so um, invested. Yes. In yeah. that social work aspect. And I kind of wanted to hit on that, like, 
You've been so sweet to invite us down to visit you. And I always hear that Charleston is so amazing. So I'm like, I I just want to sit and talk with you so much more. But I can imagine a lot of people are going to hear about your villagers and want to come. (laughs) Can I get into that village? (laughs) Unbelievable how fast this community is growing. And having worked in the Jewish community here, it was really hard to kind of keep up with that. Um, You know, this community, Charleston's one of the oldest Jewish communities in the country. Um, prior to the Civil War, we had the largest Jewish population in the U.S. Um, in Charleston? I, in Charleston. What? Bigger than New York. Bigger than New York at the time because when the colony of Charleston was founded, the um, Constitution, the Charter, said we welcome people of all faiths and religions, including Jews, and, you know, and they named a bunch of them, but the Jewish people were specifically named mm. in that. And so people from Eastern Europe and who were coming over and from Spain and Portugal, when they were coming over to the U S they decided to come to Charleston as a port city. It was easy access. Um, and they knew that they would be welcomed here. So it was this very, um, it was this very open community. Yeah. Um, and even now we have this incredibly strong Jewish community that is trying to figure out how to adapt to our very rapid growth. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. The other thing I kind of wanted to speak to about that is for starters, I'm so thankful for the community you have. Like I could just cry thinking how fortunate you are and like how cool it is that you are that for so many. And it also, I'm like, we've lived the same life. I'm like, I've been a camp director and a youth director and a (laughs) holiday church, this and that, like everything is so similar in so many ways. And here's silly me. I was thinking, I hope you speak to your faith and how it informs your life. Well, of course it's been everything. (laughs) We have that in common. Like it's, it, it really, who you are as a part of who you are, like the group and the community is, is everything. I mean, it's really beautiful how you talk about it. I was really lucky in Indianapolis growing up because my dad, I don't know if you remember, Sarah, but my dad was the director of first the Jewish Community Center okay. and then became the director of the Jewish Federation. Okay. So growing up, we were immersed in that life. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, typically there's always this joke that like, you know, you you come across a, a guy, a Jewish guy gets des- found on a deserted island and they come and rescue him after 10 years. And he's taking them around and showing them all the places and things that he's built and the infrastructure. And he shows them, oh, this is the hospital I built just in case. And this is the school I built just in case. And <laughs> here's the synagogue. And they point over there and they, well, what's that? He says, well, that's the synagogue that I built that I don't go to. And- <laughs> That's sort of that there's so many Jewish people out there who don't, you know, I won't go to this synagogue or I won't go to that synagogue because that's not how I practice. And growing up, we belong to all of them Mm -hmm. because that was what my family wanted to do. My family wanted us to be able to find God and to connect in every environment. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's how we're raising our kids. My husband, um, Scott, and I firmly believe that you're going to grow up and you're going to find who you are and and what your beliefs are. And we want it to be somewhere that you're always going to be able to connect with God. Yeah. Uh, And so that's, that's super important to us. We're sending our kids. My oldest has now graduated, but we've sent our children to um, Jewish day school. Mm -hmm. And that Jewish day school has been the foundation for the village. All of our friends in the village have at one point sent their children through the school. Okay. That's where we've met our people. Um, some of them have older kids and their older kids graduated by the time my kids started, but we still have that solid foundation. And, and even if we go to different synagogues, we know that we are all still there for one another. Yeah. Uh, it's just all what share- you do, as you said. Yeah. It's just what we do. Exactly. Exactly. Um, you know, it's been, um, it's been such a phenomenal community to be a part of. And growing up, I would hear my parents talk with such love because I, w- I was born in Charleston. I don't know if you remember that. Oh, era, no, I don't. Okay. Yeah, I was born here. And because my father worked in the Jewish communal world, um, we like to call ourselves Jewish communal brats. Yeah. Um, like every right. time our dad got a new Jewish communal job, we would move. Yeah. Um, so we moved from Charleston when I was about three to Indy. Okay. Um, and Andy was where we lived the longest, yeah. but my parents talked forever about 
how much they loved the Charleston community and they maintained these friendships with people in Charleston. And we have cousins here, we would come back and visit. And I always longed for that immersive village of a life that we had in Germany and and that, you know, we've been able to recreate that here. And it's been so wonderful. Um, We're just really, really lucky. Very blessed. Yes. How has your village and community um, responded or been affected by the recent shooting in the synagogue? Well, it's funny. That's the, um, that was kind of the story I, and I might cry while I say this, so I apologize in advance. Cry away. Um, (laughs) So before we moved to Charleston, we were living in Akron, Ohio, and Mm -hmm. Akron's about two hours outside of Pittsburgh. And um, all of our friends in Akron have ties to Pittsburgh. Um, My old boss lives in Pittsburgh. He lives about three blocks from where the shooting was. Squirrel Hill, that neighborhood, is this incredibly tight-knit community. Um, So regardless of the fact that it was someone Jewish or someone not Jewish, we immediately felt like we needed to to step up and be part of it. We were here in Charleston when the Mother Emanuel shooting happened mm-hmm. uh, three and a half years ago. Yeah. Um, my older two were at sleepaway camp. My little one went to day camp that day, and um, even though he was still um, he was still on the run, we felt compelled to show up. Yeah. And, you know, I, I remember being in the car that morning, driving down to the prayer vigil that was going to be held at a, a sister church up the street. And, um, we went there and, and in the car, someone called into one of the radio stations and it was all everybody was talking about. And, um, the, the disc jockey says, well, you know, are you, are you worried that, you know, we've had these riots in Baltimore and we've had these riots in Ferguson and, and the caller said, what the, the DJ said, what are you talking about? This is Charleston. We will get through this and we will get through mm-hmm. this together. And I have to tell you, it was so powerful sitting in that church. We ended up, we were up in the balcony and we were towards the front, like all the way in the front. And, um, we were lucky cause we got there early enough. We were able to get seats. There were about 300 people outside who couldn't even get in because the church was so full. And every single one of our community rabbis, we have five community rabbis who have active congregations. Every single one of those rabbis showed up mm. and was present. Um, Rabbi Alexander, who is a, she's the reform synagogue rabbi, um, which is the oldest continuously used synagogue in the country. Our Reform Congregation is where the beginning of Reform Judaism in the United States started. So it's this incredibly mm. deeply rich history. Yeah. She not only showed up, but she sat in the front row with Reverend Pinckney's family. He was the reverend who um, who was murdered. And um, that Friday night, so the shooting happened on it was a happened on a Tuesday night. Wednesday was the vigil, and. Friday night, Rabbi Alexander and the assistant rabbi at the time sent out an email to the entire congregation saying, we are canceling our Friday night Shabbat services tonight. And instead, we're holding services across the street at the College of Charleston um, um, gymnasium so that we can accommodate more people. And we have made ourselves available to the Mother Emanuel community because we know that they have just lost their faith leader. Mm. And we want them to know that we are here for them. Yeah. And it was so beautiful the way our community stepped up that when the shooting happened in Pittsburgh, the community surrounded us. Mm. And um, in downtown Charleston, about a block and a half away from Mother Emanuel, we actually have a Holocaust memorial. Okay. Um, there were probably 20 or 30 Holocaust survivors who, after the war, moved to Charleston and wanted um, the the legacy to be remembered. And so they built this beautiful, beautiful memorial in the middle of Marion Square, which is the center of the heart of historic Charleston, the peninsula of Charleston. And so the mayor reached out to us, to the Jewish community, and said, we want to hold a prayer vigil, and we want to hold a prayer vigil Sunday night shooting happened Saturday morning. Um, Sunday morning, there was a a meeting at our synagogue, which happens to be a conservative synagogue, which happens to be the same branch of Judaism where tree of life falls. Okay. And, um, we, we showed up because there was this congregational meeting that was planned anyway. And the first thing we noticed was that we showed up and there was a police officer in the parking lot. 
and and you know we're we're good friends with our rabbi, we're good yeah. friends with the security guard that we have every Saturday morning and every big event. And we were told that the Charleston Police Department reached out to the synagogue immediately after it happened, mm. and they showed up right away. And um, that Sunday morning, we had a huge turnout for our congregational meeting. And we started the meeting with a memorial service and knowing that our community is going to show up, we're not going to cower in fear and we're going to actually be stronger in spite of, Mm -hmm. um, the Jewish Federation in Charleston worked with the mayor and put together this candlelight vigil. I mean, in less than 24 hours. Mm. And what I found striking was that we started at the Holocaust Memorial as Mm -hmm. as the sun was setting Sunday night, and we we gathered, and every rabbi was given an opportunity to speak. We had um, a member of our community who's a huge philanthropist, very, very actively engaged in the community, who's the child of a survivor, who wow. talked about her mother, and her mother, thankfully, is still alive, and she talked about her mother's experience um, in the war and how her mother, I think it was her mother's brother, was murdered in a synagogue in Eastern Europe. And now here it is happening again. And, and to know that and to have that fear, but to look around and be surrounded by probably Mm. 400, 500 people gathered and know that it wasn't just Jewish people gathered. It was the entire community. There were ministers who were, who spoke pastors, who spoke imams who spoke. And we, at the end of the the part that, of the service that took place, the Holocaust Memorial, we actually did a silent march, a silent candlelight march to Mother Emanuel. And we gathered in mm-hmm. front of Mother Emanuel and our rabbi, the conservative rabbi, Rabbi Rosenbaum, um, had somehow been connected with a gentleman who had landed that day in Charleston. He's from Pittsburgh. He lives in Squirrel Hill, the neighborhood where this happened. And his daughter is studying abroad in Israel this year and was going to read this beautiful Facebook post that his daughter wrote. And he got up there and he was asked to come and speak. So he came up and, you know, is standing up in front of the the doors of Mother Emanuel, which Mm -hmm. if you've never seen it, there's these beautiful steps that lead up to Mother Emanuel. So we're all gathered on the ground, holding our candles while they're up there speaking and the father was so overcome, he couldn't even speak. Mm-hmm. So the rabbi read the words that, that this gentleman's daughter had written, and he was able, here I am tearing up, yes. he was able to compose himself enough to thank everyone <sighs> and to thank us for, for just surrounding them with love. And um, it was such a beautiful moment. And, and, you know, when the last speaker spoke, they thanked us for coming. As we were walking in this... The, the thing that really stood out to me the most was as we were walking to Mother Emanuel, they told the bells 11 times, yeah. one by one, with a silent pause in the middle. And here we are marching silently, united different faiths, different ways of practicing even the same faith. Mm-hmm. And we're all united together. And we stood there, and um, as we finished, as the speakers finished, as people started to kind of walk away, we're hugging one another. And a, a, a friend of mine, my friend Robin, who is the music director at KKBE, the Reform Synagogue, starts to sing this very well-known song, which is a, it's the last line of a prayer that we say three times a day, um, that the words are essentially translated, um, may God who makes peace in the heavens bring peace to us Hmm. and to all Israel. And so we start to sing just spontaneously broken a song. And and Sarah, you'll appreciate this. It wasn't just song. It was song with four part harmony. Hmm. I mean, that just spontaneously happened. And, um, you know, as we're doing this, Scott and I made a point. We wanted our kids to witness this. We wanted our kids to be there with us. We brought them. They came, we stood by our friends my parents were there. They stood by their grandparents. They saw all of their friends there. And then it just so happened that David, my middle one, was standing next to Scott, holding his candle and just kind of put his arm around Scott 
and leaned his head on his shoulder. And there was, you know, and David's one of those like really snuggly little kids. Uh-huh. Just he's almost 13, but he is, he's got such a heart mm-hmm. and such empathy. And um, there's a, a photographer from our local paper, here I am crying, who so am I. And I didn't even see her, but she snuck up and snapped the picture and caught this moment. Um, and, you know, we came home and, and we found the picture. And as we're talking about it, um, we started talking about why that particular synagogue was targeted. Yeah. And what we've sort of been able to gather is that synagogue was targeted because they support an organization called HIAS, H-I-A-S, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society. It's, this organization is about 200 years old, and it started because there were Jews coming to the U.S. as refugees from mm-hmm. different countries in Eastern Europe, and they needed help. They were coming here legally. They needed help immigrating and and resettling. And this organization for 200 years has helped people resettle and they've expanded. They're not just helping Jews resettle, but they're helping people from all over the world who are here legally, who are refugees, who, if they go back to their own countries are going to be killed. And this guy, I won't even honor him by saying his name, found out that Tree of Life supported this organization and did a fundraiser for them. And so he decided that he was going to target that particular synagogue and he went and attacked them and david my my son as part of his preparation for his bar mitzvah has to do a mitzvah project a good deed project and has spent the summer working with kids with special needs just because he he loves it he enjoys it he's empathetic towards it and when he found out about this he said you know what i want to do something for highest i want to do something Uh. for them because of the good work that they're doing and so he actually um he actually made these bracelets. I don't know if y'all can see it. Um, yeah, more yeah. than blue are colors. And it says, um, it says, I stand with Hyas. Okay. And so he's been selling them and he's going to give all the money to Hyas as wow. a donation um, because of the importance of standing together and supporting yeah. each other. And like, I just look at this child and it's one of those moments that you have as a mom where you're like, oh my God. The things that I'm saying are actually getting through to you. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, like you're so listening. Efforts. Thank you. Yeah. And in so many ways, they teach us. Yeah. Like, yeah. Golly. Oh, absolutely. I, I'm, yeah, 100%. Wow. I love even the phrase, the good work, because I see even tonight talking, I'm like, this feels like good work. Like me, I feel like I'm sitting at your feet kind of hearing firsthand about all of these experiences and um, that good work. I didn't know that those, of course, behind the scenes pieces. And it, it's, it just amazes me, really. It makes me feel hopeful. It does. And yeah. I think a lot of times I feel um, because of things that are going on in the world, um, it can be easy to feel hopeless. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I don't think I'm a pessimistic person by nature, but it, it can feel, it can feel hopeless. Yeah. And knowing that in times of tragedy, that people do come together and especially in the ways that you've mentioned across different faiths, across different backgrounds, um, that brings me hope. Yeah. That makes me remember the goodness within yeah. um, our humanity and that we are willing to put aside differences in, in how we live our life, how we practice our faith um, to come together, to be that village and to care for one another. Yeah. Someone posted on Facebook afterwards, after the shooting that, um, that this literally happened in Mr. Rogers neighborhood. Hmm. Um, and I've heard a quote repeatedly attributed to him. And I, I, don't know if it really is him or not, but that, you know, in times of, of fear and times of tragedy, you always look for the helpers. Yes. Yeah. And I, I love the fact, I'm grateful for the fact that, that we're surrounded by helpers and that that's the example my children are seeing. Yeah. And that we're able to show them and model for them and, and be with them 
to be the helpers. Yeah. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm very lucky that I've got this incredible village. I'm very lucky that I've got incredible parents who taught my brothers and I that. Mm-hmm. Sarah, you too. I mean, I know you grew up with an incredibly strong faith and faith family. And Yes, you're very fortunate and lucky and all that. But like you're doing the hard work of bringing your kids to witness that stuff when it could be scary. So, I mean, kudos to you for pressing through and doing that. And it could be easier to stay home. Yeah. And not be present and not show up, but you're choosing to show up. And that's, that's so important. Yeah. I can only hope that my children will grow up to do the same. Yeah. You know? Yep. Wow. Yeah. You've given us so much to think about and so much to ponder and so much to just (laughs) kind of dwell on. Yeah. And we are so grateful for that. We're so grateful for the story that you shared with us tonight. And we hope that you will continue to do that good work and um, invite other people to be a part of that village and that hopefully our Momnesia community, if they don't have that village already, Mm -hmm. that they will say, okay, I'm going to be the one that creates the village. I'm going to be the one that takes the first step because it just takes one person to get that going. Like you said, it just takes one person to start that text message. And I think so many people desire to be a part of that. Yeah. But they may not have, I don't know, the courage Mm -hmm. or the, um, assertiveness to be the one to take that step. And so I hope, um, our momnesia community will be people like that, that are willing to take that first step and create that village right where they're at bloom, where they are planted. Yeah. Definitely. We we proudly joke that, um, at my daughter's bat mitzvah, um, a couple of years ago, one of the villagers actually got up to speak and make a presentation on behalf of the congregation. He talked for a minute about how, you know, you're an adult now and these are your responsibilities. And he says, you know, you know, your mom always calls us the villagers. Well, congratulations. You are now a village idiot along with the right. rest of us. <laughs> right. That's awesome. That's awesome. Did you say, if I can ask, um, is your daughter's health, is that still, you have to mess with hospitals and testing or is she doing well? She is doing great. Thankfully, uh, um, all of the scary stuff got ruled out. Um, it got ruled out pretty quick around the time of her bat mitzvah. So we were very grateful and very, um, we were able to celebrate and really embrace that. Um, but that was really kind of the experience. And I I didn't really, I didn't really piece it together until you guys asked me, um, kind of what the, what the story was that I was going to, that I wanted to forget. Uh And Scott and I were talking about it last night and I kind of had this epiphany of like, you know what? That was really when I started thinking about going into nursing. Wow. Um, yeah. Because I watched these incredible nurses at the children's hospital being advocates for their patients, being advocates for their health and making sure that the families were well cared for and well supported. Um, and thinking that, you know what, that's kind of a new calling that I think I have in life. And, uh, that, kind of got things started. And shortly after that was when I made the decision to kind of make the jump. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. The passion behind what you do, the purpose and all like it, I mean, it just is so evident. That's awesome. Well, we have kind of a, a light way to end. If you will humor us here, Julie, why don't you take it over? Okay. Well, we are going to end with the mom seat. And if you haven't <laughs> experienced the mom seat before, It is meant to be a quick go with your gut answer. Um, We try to move through it quickly (laughs) and uh, it's meant to show that uh, we all have some things in common. We may have different motherhood journeys, but uh, we all, we're all pretty much doing the same thing (laughs) around here. Like I said, I'm going to get started with our first question. I'll give you two options and you choose the best one that kind of hits your gut. It may not be the one that you always do, but the one that that first comes to mind. All right? Okay, here we go. Disposable or cloth? Cloth. Bottle or breast? Breast. Pinterest mom or Amazon Prime mom? Amazon Prime, 100%. (laughs) Jeans or yoga pants? Yoga pants. Top knot or ponytail? 
Pony, uh, ooh. <laughs> ponytail, because this mess does not happen overnight. <laughs> <laughs> Home birth or hospital? Hospital. Give me the drugs. Chore chart or managing chaos? Managing chaos. Gender nope. reveal or find out when it pops out? We found out when, when it popped out with all three of them. Yay. Instagram or Facebook? Ooh. Instagram and post to Facebook through Instagram. How about that? <laughs> Homemade or store-bought? Store-bought. Lullabies or sound machine? Lullabies. Five servings of veggies per day or per month? Per day. Ooh. President of the PTA or I'll send in some goldfish. I will send in some goldfish. Bubble bath and a good book or girls night out? Girls night out. Weekly meal plan or McDonald's drive through uh, Weekly meal plan with the addendum that if I don't nope, get no nope, no nope. uh, weekly meal oh plan no. homeschool or go to school go to school in your home free bird or robed up Ooh, robed up <laughs> favorite parenting resource other moms favorite place to buy kids clothes old navy and you have completed the mom seat <laughs> but wait <laughs> i want to hear the addendum no nope. back- yes <laughs> i'm just kidding <laughs> okay so what I do is, and it, and it is me, even though I'm not the one usually home actually making the meals, but it is me. I'm the planner. I'm the shopper. Um, I put together a menu for the week and I shop only to the menu. Okay. But if I forget to pull the salmon out of the freezer or whatever, and just because I don't have time, we will adjust and pick something else, but it has to be on the menu for that week. Ooh, okay. I like her. Yeah. yeah. I like her a if lot. My hus- I will say if my husband is in charge and I'm not home, he might deviate and do, you know, Taco Bell drive through. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good plan. I like it. Yeah. This has been awesome. It's so good to chat with you. I think we should start making this a regular thing. So if I you don't mind, that. I'm going to put you on speed dial. Um, so, and I'll start planning my visit. <laughs> Uh, so fun. I love showing people around Charleston. I love it. I love it. I love it. We'll make it happen. Well, thank right. you so much for the privilege of hearing your story. And we're getting emotional with you in many parts oh. of that. So thank you. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah. Loved hearing it. Yeah. Love you, friend. We'll talk to you soon. Love Bye. You Bye. Bye. We hope you will come back next week on the Momnesia podcast where we're going to share more stories before Momnesia sets in and we forget it all. Have a great week. Today's episode of Momnesia was recorded at Grace Church in Noblesville, Indiana with original music by Phil Larson. Make sure to check out Grace's podcast between Sundays and Phil's music at Spotify or iTunes. 